This is Real Sales Talk. Real sales advice from real sales practitioners. Giving you tips on how to dominate your sales quota are your co host Sean Mitchell and Phil Keen. We don't have a process for referrals at most companies. I go into a company, I say, what's your referral process? They have no, well, what do you mean? I think that, I think that goes back to the premise that why do salespeople suck at prospecting? I mean, number one reason why they suck at prospecting is they don't actually do it. If you are successful and nobody knows, in, 2000, in 2016, 20, 2025, you're not successful. If you ever want to find out what's going on in the company, get in the car and spend a day with the top three salespeople. You'll find out in five minutes. Because you can't be a trusted advisor without two things, trust and advice. I mean, you need both of them. What's going on, everyone? It's Real Sales Talk. Sean here, and we are going strong and live with Season 4, Episode uh, 7. Yes, 7, I think it is. And um, uh, we've got a really great guest, James Pember. Pember, is, is, is how you pronounce your last name? That's right. Yes. All right. And uh, you may be thinking, gosh, if you're watching the video, at least, where is Phil? Well, Phil had a, a meeting come up that he could not get uh, out of. So uh, it'll be me and James rocking with sales performance. This is going to be the topic. It's the first time we've ever covered this before. Um, James, I want to say thank you for uh, joining the Real Sales Talk show podcast. Welcome. Sure. Thanks for having me. Really excited. Really excited to, uh, to dig in. It's interesting that you say you've never dug into that topic before, so plenty to talk about then. Absolutely. Yes, there absolutely is. And I think our audience is really going to like this one um, because it's relevant to both uh, the, 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 those that listen to this podcast on the leadership side as well as those that are sitting in a sales role. So first of all, um, I'd love for you to talk about, um, tell us a little bit about uh, what Sparta is because that's going to help us frame this conversation about sales performance. Sure. So I can begin with a little bit of a sort of introduction to the company. So, th so the name of the company is Sparta, uh, which is probably sort of conjuring up images already of sort of winning and warriors and uh -huh. that, which I think is particularly fun for sales. But, you know, to dig into what we do, we're a team that is really sort of passionate about helping salespeople reach their full potential. So, so that, that's our mission statement. That's what we want to achieve uh, in the long term, sort of reaching full potential. Uh, and if possible, reach it faster as well. And, and what we do is we help organizations, you know, measure, reward, and motivate their teams in a more modern and effective way. Um, and today, you know, I'll, I'll dig into what I mean by sort of modern and effective. Um, but that's what we do. Sort of, again, you know, measure, sort of reward, and, and motivate the teams. And how we do it is we do it with gamification, which I know is a little bit of a buzzword. Uh, and I know there's probably plenty of people listening right now thinking, oh, gamification isn't that very 2011. Um, but, you know, I think that sort of we're in the second wave of it now. And so we think that, you know, gamification when done well can be the best way to sort of measure and, and motivate and inspire your team into, into high performance. So, so that's what we do. Let's, let's, let's kind of roll with that. Um, Gamification. For those that are unfamiliar with it, what is it? Um, maybe, maybe provide some context for some some software, some companies that people might be aware of, and then let's dive into as well. Lastly, around that topic, um, how you're tackling that uh, gamification. Sure. So, I mean, gamification. I mean, gamification. If you look up the definition, I think it's something like uh, the use of game mechanics to drive participation. Uh, in a non-game environment. So it's obviously taking sort of what works with games uh, and applying that to, you know, to work or health, fitness, uh, or any other sort of, sort of environment. And when we talk about mechanics, uh, the mechanics that are sort of most often associated with gamification are points, badges, levels, you know, avatars, um, and all those sorts of things, which people will recognize from sort of, you know, everything from Super Mario to, to World of Warcraft. Um, but I think what's interesting about gamification and sales is that sales already is a game. You know, like uh, all of the mechanics are actually already quite game-esque, right? You start every quarter at zero, you level up to some sort of, uh, you know, boss level, you beat the boss, you beat your number, uh, you unlock some commission, there's accelerators on fire. You know, sales is very sort of, it's very competitive. Um, often the career path is very sort of well-defined, very much like a game progressing through the levels. So I think 
you know, my view is that sales and gamification is a good match. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen gamification uh, sort of work or business gamification sort of, you know, in my view, sort of fail a little bit. And I, and I, and I argue that, you know, in other departments, it's a lot harder to get buy-in. Uh, whereas I believe in sales, there is this natural sort of game spirit, which makes it a, a match. However, um, you know, if done wrong, I think it can be disastrous. Like I, I really do. I think, um, again, there's probably plenty of people with their headphones in right now thinking levels, badges, points. It's, it's a waste of time. It's childish. Um, and I think, you know, in many ways that's true. If you do this the wrong way, if you measure the wrong things, if you reward the wrong people and you set up the game in an ineffective way, I think it can be can be hurtful. Um, but like I said, I think, you know, we, we see that we're in sort of the second wave. So, uh, you know, we're pretty confident that it can be a really, really powerful tool. What are some examples of maybe some, some gamification that, that uh, our listeners may have been exposed to, but maybe not realized it? Hmm. Yeah, and, and this is a this is a really fun topic, right? Because I think you know, I think uh, you know, I meet a lot of salespeople every day, and one of the natural things is that salespeople are often very uh, into sports. Uh, like I don't know what that is, right? And let's not dig into dig into that. Um, and you know, often people that are in sports are also into fitness. And take take running, right? Like which I'm sure a large you know portion of the audience are into right or lifting weights or whatever it might be playing soccer but take running and i think look at you know look at look at apps or products like runkeeper look at nike plus look at strava you know these tools are very very good at sort of tapping into those game mechanics so there's often you know levels there's a lot of social there's a lot of um you know there's a lot of sort of uh, cheering there's a lot of uh you know, there's a lot of accountability, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of badges and, and all those sorts of things. And I think that, you know, that's typically when I meet sales teams for the first time, that's the gamification they've been exposed to, um, you know, sports and health. So uh, for a lot of salespeople, and, I, and, and myself included, um, a leaderboard, I think, would be the, 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 the like, ideal gamification you know, when you've got this massive or, you know, screen, big screen TV or even a place where you can log in uh, to Salesforce or somewhere else and see um, where you're at in comparison to your sales peers, right? Good, good gamification yeah. example? Uh, yes. However, I'd argue that I think that's, you know, the, the sort of the, the sales leaderboard is, I mean, that's something that, you know, everyone's doing anyway, right? There's not, there's not a company I meet every day that isn't you know isn't using some sort of some sort of leaderboard however i think i think now we're we're encroaching into the area where things can go wrong um and and one of the one of the things that's interesting with the leaderboard is you have to be very very careful that you're actually achieving what you want to achieve um and and, and let's get into this because this is where sort of gamification can go all sorts of wrong uh slash just be completely ineffective so the problem with leaderboards as they are today is that typically they're they're measuring one thing, closed one, bookings, revenue, uh, you know, one deals. And that's fine. Uh, obviously, like bottom line is, is, is closing deals and, and every organization works that way. However, um, gamification is, is, you know, again, you're, you're trying to drive participation. You're trying to drive engagement and focus. When you only measure closed one bookings, there's only a very small number of your team that actually have a chance of being at the top of that leaderboard. I mean, if we're very honest, you know, I meet, you know, hundreds of VP sales a month. And if you're very honest with them and say, Sean, you're running a contest next month. It's ranking everyone on closed one. Who is going to win? You know. I mean, you know, it might be one of three people, but you already know. So this is where I think the game sucks because if you're a middle performer, it's not a game. You know I'm going to end up in position 45. So it's not a game, right? So I think, you know, what we're doing um, – uh, is really coming in and saying leaderboards are great, the mechanic is great, but what you measure is really important, right? Because, you know, it's not a fun game if you know you're going to lose all the time. And the funny thing about sales teams is the performance curve is always the same, right? You have a small amount of, you know, kick-ass rock stars. You have a, a small amount that are really struggling and just not performing at all, and you have a lot of people in the middle. Sometimes make the number, sometimes don't. Uh, often, often have the talent. Uh, they're often lazy, they're often unengaged, and they're actually often forgotten because 
uh, how leaders work, it's quite, it's quite interesting when you look at it. all the love goes to the top performers. So they're at the top of the leaderboard, they're winning President's Club, they're making the most money, they're going up on the wall, they're being featured in the emails. The people at the bottom, ironically, are getting all the attention from the managers. Although, you know, my argument is those people need to go. Like, it sounds harsh, but they just need to go. The people in the middle, and I, you know, we call it internally sort of the middle 60%. So it's the, it's the core of your organization, but it's also all of your potential for growth, right? If you look at a top performer in sales, they're often very close to their potential. A middle performer has a long way to go, right? Maybe they end up at 60% of the number every quarter. If you can get them to 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, that's where you're going to grow. So, you know, coming back to the original question, leaderboards, leaderboards are good, but if you're forgetting those middle group that actually need the engagement, that's all your potential for growth, they don't work because the people in the middle are also, they're also, they're programmed to understand, I'm a middle performer. Like, I know it sounds odd, but when you talk to them, they know, like, I'm not Sean, Sean's at the top every quarter, I'm in the middle somewhere, I give up. Um, and, you know, I you know, obviously read about this topic a lot. I think, you know, it's been proven as well that sometimes that sort of competitive spirit, whilst I'm a huge fan of it, it can actually demotivate those middle people, which is ironic, right? Because the, the, the last point on this is that the people at the top, they actually don't need the motivation. They're self-motivated. Like they have the fire inside them, right? So you could take away the leaderboard and they'd still be at the top. Uh, so to sort of wrap up on that, I know it was long winded, but it's one of my sort of favorite topics. I think you've got to be really careful. What do you measure? And I think, you know, that's potentially where the leaderboard sort of, you know, can be a little bit shaky. Okay. So, okay, so a leaderboard uh, is going to, um, is going to address probably those top performers. It's going to highlight who the, who the best sales people are, like the middle of the pack. Um, and, and those that, that maybe, maybe have the willingness to get better, but or at the at the, at the back of the pack, how yeah. do you motivate those if the leaderboard and and top revenue and deals closed is not the best way? How do you how do you get them engaged? How do you get them so that they are moving towards a top performer uh, 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 area? Yeah, and this is really sort of. You know, I, I, uh, I think I wrote on LinkedIn the other day, my personal mission in 2017 is to, is to talk to more people about this topic. And, you know, I, I, call it, I call it actions, not outcomes. That's a little bit of my, like, personal credo for this year. How you, how you motivate the middle is you start measuring and rewarding people for different things. Now, revenue closed one is always going to be most important KPI, end of the day, you know, growth and profitability, that, that's number one. However, to motivate the middle, again, you start measuring and rewarding people for doing different things. And again, you measure and reward people for doing the actions that lead to the outcomes, not the outcomes themselves. So instead of saying, Sean, uh, let, let's use the most simple game example of it, Sean, you get 10 points every time you close a deal. That, that could be like a very sort of typical setup. You know, what I'm saying is that why not take the people in the middle and reward them for doing the things that will actually help them close more deals? The, the next layer down would be, you know, created opportunities. I argue you need to go deeper. Is it booked meetings? Mm, maybe. I think you can go even, even deeper. What are the behaviors that top people do? Do they spend an extra hour in the office? Do they send a handwritten letter to every you know, prospect they meet? Do they connect with every sort of cold call on LinkedIn? Do they write content on LinkedIn? Are they doing social sharing? Like whatever it is, right? You always know what do the best people do? Start, start incentivizing the middle to do that. Because when you look at the curve, again, you have these sort of, uh, I call them like high value behaviors. That's what the top people do. Um, the middle people don't do it. Uh, but when you start incentivizing people for doing it, you start rewarding people for doing it, that's when they start doing it because it's easy, right? Anyone can, anyone can, you know, uh, anyone can connect with all their cold calls on LinkedIn. Anyone can write content on LinkedIn. Anyone can, you know, I've seen customers do all sorts of things. I've seen customers uh, say, you know, you can collect points every time you make the customer smile or laugh on the phone. You know, whatever these behaviors are, Anyone can do them, unlike closed one, right? Like there, there is a natural sort of gap in, you know, great, good and bad. 
And that's what, that's what gets the middle engaged, right? Because here's what happens. In their head, they start thinking, I can win this. I'm great. I'm, so, so, I'm getting rewarded. I feel good. I'm getting pats on the back. I'm going up the leaderboard. And that's when the magic happens, right? Because that's when you engage that middle group and then you can shift them up. If, and if you can get, you know, let's hypothesize. Let's say you have 60% of your team are sort of middle performers. If you can get every single one of those up one, two, three percent, that's meaningful growth. If you get your top performers up one, two, three percent, that's nothing because they're already at the top and there's so few of them. Uh, so that, that's my sort of that's my sort of uh, philosophy for motivating the middle, engaging the middle. I like that. Um... So you, you, I've, I've been following you online for, for many months, maybe, maybe six, eight months now. You've been very good at trying to crowdsource um, data and results. So what types of things have you seen from your customers uh, in maybe more generally speaking when a sales leader starts to do something like that where they're engaging and, and gamifying some of those activities that produce that lead to the results? Sure. So I'll give you one example, and we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk uh, a telco company. So it's a telecom company uh, here in Europe, not unlike you know an AT and T or Sprint or a Verizon. Very, very sort of similar uh, company, similar setup. I, I'd argue very sort of similar demographics of staff, etc. And um, like all telcos, they are struggling. Facebook is obviously killing their business uh, very rapidly. Um, and so for telcos, what telcos are sitting now and, and talking about in the boardroom is we need to hold our customer base whilst we reinvent. So for them, satisfaction and loyalty from the customers is, is number one. That's like absolutely number one, even more than sales, which, which is, I know it sounds, sounds crazy, but they're saying we need to hold the customers. Then they have call centers like any telco. They have thousands of people taking incoming support calls. Um, and, and they're sitting there thinking, how do we get thousands of people to make sure that we have more loyal and satisfied customers? And what they did is very, very, very clever. And it's all built upon this actions, not outcomes. And, and they measure NPS, like I'm sure, or net promoter score. I'm sure many of your customers, uh, sorry, many of the listeners know what that is. And uh, CSAT, customer satisfaction. And like many telcos and banks, they send out surveys, automated surveys after the phone call. Is that a thing in the US, by the way? Yes, you, very yeah, much so. Yep. Yeah, you have this, you know, automated stay on the line and fill out a survey, and no one does those. Obviously, like I don't no. do them. You don't Never do them. done one before. And I actually have a number from this telco. It was three percent of of incoming calls daily filled out the survey. So it's very, very, very little. I, I'm actually impressed that it's not lower. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I guess in some way, 3%, I, and I guess we're talking sort of, uh, it might be 10,000 calls a day. I'm not sure it might be more. Um, but obviously, getting people to fill out those surveys is important, right? Because that's how you're going to get the feedback you need to improve the, the service and therefore MPS and CSAT. Um, and what they thought or what they noticed is people don't care about the survey. I mean, I saw your face as I was coming. You don't care about the survey. Um, so what they did is very clever. And um, this is getting to the point now. They said every time you pitch the importance of the survey to the customer on, on the other end of the line, you can collect uh, 10 points. And a few caveats here. I mean, that's honesty system. They can collect those points themselves. There's no voice recording or integration. It's, it's purely about saying, hey, Sean, every time you are on the phone today and you tell someone about the importance of that, of that survey, you can collect 10 points. And so what they would do on the phone is they would say, Sean, okay, thanks for today. Your new phone is on the way. Uh, anything else I can help you with? No. Okay. Can you please take three minutes to fill out the survey after the call? I know it's a bit frustrating and time consuming, but we would really appreciate it. And this sounds simple, but amazing things happened. Two things happened. One, the number of surveys being filled out went from sort of 3% to 25%. I mean, it just spiked and that's simple, right? That's saying, I will reward you for doing something. I mean, that's basic sort of behavioral psychology. Um, here's, here's the cool thing, though, and here's the epic result. So that happened. Then what happened is obviously uh, surveys went up, MPS went up, CSAT went up, sales went up. All the right things went up, right? More customers engage with the surveys. They engage with the brand. They're more likely to give positive, positive reviews. The, the coolest thing, though, is that the, the reps started feeling, when we interviewed the reps after we implemented this, they said that 
because I knew in three minutes that I was going to ask them to fill out this survey, I had to do a better job in that sort of, you know, previous, the, the previous five minutes of the call. So all of the core metrics went up based on one simple thing, 10 points every time you pitch the survey to the customer. So that, that's just one example of how powerful this actions, not outcomes thing is because what they didn't do is say, Sean and, you know, thousand other support reps, we need to increase NPS because that's an outcome. What they said is, what can you do today to drive that outcome? And so that, that's one example, but I think that's the power of actions, not outcomes. How, how does, so you've got this gamification piece, which, which um, makes things more interesting and sometimes maybe a, maybe a mundane process, like if you're a BDR or an SDR, you're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, how, how often do you see incentives tied to the gamification? So if, if for, for, for the top one or two people or three, um, for those that hit X, number of book deals or surveys, mm -hmm. you're going to get a Amazon gift card. Are those often tied together? Because in my mind, salespeople are typically pretty competitive and they want to win something. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is getting into a very interesting topic, which is compensation, right? All sort of like how does performance intersect with compensation and, and, and all those sorts of things. And I think the, the first thing is that I, I believe that uh, as an industry, we are too caught up around money in sales. Like, like I know it sounds a bit silly. Of course, like we're trying to build company, grow revenue. And I, I as much as anyone, I'm trying to do that. But I think what's happened though, is that companies have forgotten that or, or companies haven't grasped that the times are changing. And I, you know, I, I know some of the other episodes you've done have been about sort of this engagement topic and, and everything. But I think what's interesting is that you know, financial compensation, in my view, and, and a lot of studies show this as well, is a really average driver of long-term performance. Um, whereas I think, you know, if you look at sort of, if you look at employee turnover in sales, if you look at sort of why do people stay, people stay because they are appreciated, they think that the company has an interesting purpose, is mission-driven, they think they are, are, are respected by their management, they feel it's a fun environment, they feel they have a chance to grow. All of these sort of uh, fluffy things that fall under this idea of engagement like it's I've seen it a million times it's so true like you just cannot deny it salespeople are not coin operated machines and you know I argue on LinkedIn daily with people that disagree with me but I, I'm so confident that money is not the answer and and, in, and and with that in mind you know Amazon gift cards bottles of wine even things like you know trips I just don't think they're the answer, right? I think what you what you want to do in terms of driving performance is you want to you want to get people to understand, you know, I, I, you know. Do you know Dan Dan Pink? Have you read any of his uh, books? I'm I'm familiar with him, but have yet to uh, actually. Uh, what's his most well known book? Uh, the most well known book is called Drive, and I think it's called The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And he he has this classic theory, which is there are three things that everyone wants uh, at work. And the first one is autonomy. So, you know, they basically, they don't want to be sort of chained to a desk and, 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 and whipped. So they want some level of sort of freedom and responsibility and autonomy to decide how they, how they sort of conduct their work. Um, they want autonomy. They want mastery. So they want, they want to get better. And I think this is an interesting one in sales, right? Like people, people really want to get better. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's something that's definitely worth keeping in mind. And then the last one is purpose. So they want, I mean, this is why companies like Google and Airbnb and Facebook are able to attract and retain the best people is because they have these strong purposes, they have these strong missions. And I think if you, if you as a company can do that, if you can give people autonomy, mastery and purpose, you know, I think that that financial piece just becomes a, like a, almost like a, a sort of sanity check, right? Like a, a hygiene factor. You know, you've got to pay people well and fairly, but I don't think you can throw money at people anymore. Maybe you could before but I definitely don't think you can now. So I think, you know, to, to go back to your question of, you know, sort of winning and, and you know, you mentioned gift cards and, and winning's important, but I don't think the gift card's important. I don't think the best people get out of bed every day to come to work to win a bottle of wine or a gift card. I think if you, yeah, you know, I'll never forget, we had one very big enterprise here and they actually, they actually sort of made a little bit of an ultimatum to the team. They said, okay, we're running this contest and the winner gets a choice. Two prizes. One, 
uh, I think it was like it was like two thousand dollars in cash or something. It was like a fairly nice sort of cash bonus. The second one was you could. I think it it, it might have been as simple as you could go and have lunch with the CEO, and th this was like a massive, you know, ten thousand employee global sort of uh, multinational, and then everyone that won picked the lunch, right? Because they chose career development, they chose progress, they chose recognition, they chose a pat on the back, a job well done. I think that, that's, uh, that's something I'm really, really strong on. Um, I've, shared, I've shared my opinion about, about money a few times. Um, What's your view? Interesting. I'd love to hear your yeah, view. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I like making money. Right, um, but I know. In fact, I'm recalling. I'm recalling where I had this conversation in depth. It was. It was actually a, a, another podcast where I was being interviewed, and purpose was kind of the all roundabout theme. And what I shared was, you know, money. Money is really the vehicle to to fulfillment. Uh, it helps you get to that place where you're most happy. But it's not the end goal. Uh, it's nice. Uh, it's nice to make a lot of money. Um, I think. I think for me personally, as a, as a sales professional, um, uh, what excites me more is is the the chase of the sale and and closing the deal. The money is rewarding, but in the end, what I really am looking for is you know in in, in the day to day, it's it's the it's the chase and and it's the hunt. But long term, I think what I think most about is taking care of my family, mm. making sure that my, you know, my kids can go to great schools. And if that means paying for a private school, then, you know, then, then I want to be able to do that. It's making sure that my wife can, you know, uh, uh, have, have the things that she needs as well. So um, the, the, the culture piece at, at, at the work, I think, can, can create an environment of, of fulfillment. But I think I, think, uh, I would probably agree, agree with you in the sense that um, money is really just the vehicle to get, to get to the happiness and to get to the fulfillment. Um, there may be some scenarios where you might need to pay more for more experience or more yeah. talent. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I think... I think it's an interesting example that you used with the two thousand dollars versus the lunch with the CEO. Um, you know, if 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 there was a CEO that I really respected, um, that might be a hard choice. Yeah. If, yeah. If I if I had the option. And and don't get me wrong, right? Like, in the, you know, you you found a company to to try and make yourself financially uh, independent, right? As well as the mission and the purpose. So so I'm not against. You know, I'm not advocating for. Uh, you know, removing commissions and 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 I I just think I think as an industry, you know, where we could move just a smidgen further is that you know you need to pay fairly and uh, if you do well, you need to make good money and 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 that's for all the reasons you said. That's for family, for uh, you know, uh, lack of uh, or less stress and 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 all those sorts of things. But I just think at scale, when 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 you talk to these you know big global sort of VP sales. It's interesting how they think about money as, or sort of as a as a vehicle to drive performance. Uh, so, on the individual rep level, completely agree with you. I think if you take a sort of you know if you take that management view and sort of okay, how are we going to drive performance this year? It's so funny, right? Because if you meet if you go and meet you know the VP sales at a big uh, Fortune 500 and you say, okay, so you've raised targets this year, how are you going to achieve those? And so often it comes down to, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to change the comp plan here. We're going to do, you know, and I think very rarely do they sit back and look at that culture piece and think, okay, how could we get more out of each person? How could we, how could we get our people to engage a little bit more to invest in, in improving their own progress? So I think, I think that's where it becomes an interesting discussion, sort of the future of, you know, will we have commissions in sales in 20 years? I'm not sure. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think it's definitely something to be explored. I mean, really, the 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 the, the true litmus test is: are you getting are you getting that performance that, that's ideal, and how can you create that environment where people are looking forward to going to work? Maybe yeah. maybe for some people it is about money. Sure. Maybe maybe they that's just that's their trigger. But maybe yeah. other people it's something else. It's 
the, the people that they work with, that, that they want to enjoy the people that they work with. Or maybe it's something as silly as, um, you know, having, having a, a kegerator with beer in the office that they can go and get any time. And, and, think, and, and I, I also think, I, I think you're spot on, and I think, think about, um, you know, think about, um, you know, I think this millennial thing, which, like uh, the word is overused and it's like it's a bit of a buzzword and a, and a, and a sort of it's a, it's a little bit too trendy to sort of talk about. But I think there definitely seems to be evidence that points to that, you know, that generation um, is different. And I think, you know, they maybe don't want to go and work at Goldman Sachs or, uh, you know, you know, and you, you know, you mentioned the keg, but it's also is it is it sort of, you know, parental time off? Is it, uh, you know, working for a company that they, they think is very meaningful? Is it doing something good in the world? And I, like, I know that, and I, you know, I can, I, can, uh, I can see some of the listeners reacting on that because I know it can come off as silly, um, but I do think it's a real trend. Like, and, and I think if you're, a, if you're a sales leader listening, running a company uh, or running a team where, you know, your staff are potentially in that sort of, you know, 25 to 35 or whatever it is age bracket, I think it is something you need to think about that I think that, and I did read a stat actually that I think it said, um, I believe the stat is I'm, I'm trying to come up. I think it was sort of, you know, 50% fewer sales reps are, are sort of, you know, purely money motivated now as compared to, I think it was 10 years ago. So I do think the tide is changing, um, which you, you need to be aware of that if you're, a, if you're, you know, leading running a sales team today. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely something that, um, so here, here's my final thought on, on, on the compensation thing. Um, each person is going to be motivated differently. And as a sales leader, you need to think about, you need, you need to take the time to sit down with each sales rep and find out what it is that makes them happy, what it is that gets them excited. Um, and as a sales rep who's listening to this episode, you need to think about the same thing as well. Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't have that, which I think is, um, maybe maybe the the Daniel Pink thing. Uh, uh, consider the why. You know what what is it that that gets you motivated, that gets you excited? Because you know once once you can find that, then the rest becomes really easy. It's not difficult to get up and show up early to work, or you know find out whatever that is. So um, I I think I think it's interesting that I don't know if. I, I think maybe sales will, will always be in some way tied to compensation, but um, what what that motivation is to get that compensation may vary from person, from sales rep to sales rep. Yeah, well said, I agree. It's, it'll be interesting to follow up. So, um, it, it kind of tied, tied to this, um, I, I, I like these topics. Um, let's talk about retention because I think that's an interesting one. I, you know, in a lot of sales organizations, you know, the, the, the employee churn rate mm -hmm. tends to be high in sales, maybe higher than others. What yeah. are you seeing? Yeah, and, and actually it's funny, you're right. I, I was actually looking at this today. So I, I wrote this down because I, I thought this might come up. And, and actually in the US, the salesperson turnover is 5X or, you know, five times larger than the national average for every other industry. Um, which is, it's pretty high, right? And, and you know, I must admit, I, I sat on that number for a few minutes thinking, okay, is it high, is it not high? But 5X, you know, the national average, that's pretty high. And of course, you know, there will, I think there will always be higher turnover in sales because of how the work is structured. You know, you either, you, you, you're, you, you either make it or you don't. But then again, I think this is also interesting. This, you know, this ties back to the very first topic of the sort of the performance curve. You know, my hypothesis is that you will always have the, again, the small number of, you know, achievers slash high overachievers, the small number of, you know, big time, you know, failures, and then the, the big group in the middle. And I think as long as we have that, as long as you either make it or you don't, you either make number or you don't, there's a, it's very binary. I think, unfortunately, we're going to have high, high turnover, right? So I think... I think all of these topics are intertwined, right? Which is why I think it's so fascinating because I think if you, if you, if you don't think about, again, you know, autonomy, mastery, purpose, if you don't think about actions, not outcomes, if you don't, if you don't 
solve for those things? I, I think you will not solve employee retention. What's your view? I mean, why, you know, why do you think salespeople leave and, and why they stay? And do you think it's possible to, you know, have less turnover than we have now and stick to the same sort of structure we have where if you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. Because, and before I just give you the word, I think, you know, if you're a salesperson and you never make the number, should you stay? Why would you stay? It, I mean, it, that, that's where I think this is interesting. How do you keep someone if they're just failing over and over? Yeah, I mean, in that case, there may be a better place inside of the organization to make a lateral move or, you know, transfer to a different department. Mm -hmm. um, my thought is, why, why is there so much turnover? Um, there is a lot of emphasis put on, on money. Uh, uh, n not so much like, like um, meeting your, your budget because, I mean, you agree to that when you accept the job position. Right. Yeah. So so there should be nothing wrong with with that per se, but it's the money chasers. It's the ah. salespeople who are moving from job to job to kind of increase their their uh, their annual income. Yeah. Um, this is the first time I thought about this, but I think and I'm thinking I'm thinking from my own experience as well as just kind of broadly. If you have a really great culture where where people feel valued where you enjoy the people that you work around and there are some of those you know maybe maybe um intangible benefits um cultural benefits that mm, that could be a, f a huge factor in why people leave because i mean like what we were talking about earlier if you're really happy and you find value in the purpose of the company, and you feel like you're valued as an employee and what you're contributing, you might be willing to take a pay cut or get paid a little bit less for, in, in, in exchange for enjoying your work environment. Mm -hmm. And here's, I, I, think, I think this is so interesting, right? Because if we, if we poke at that a little bit and we say, Okay, let's say, um, let's say, yeah, you, 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 you know, you, you get a lot of, um, you know, you get a lot of, um, you know, positive sort of feelings uh, at your workplace. You feel like you're contributing. Uh, but what if you're not hitting the number, right? What if you hit 70% of your budget every quarter? Are you being valued then? I think this is where it gets interesting. And this is where I, I push a little bit when I, when I meet customers on this topic, because can in in the sales environment that we've set up today can you feel valued or or are you valued in an organization if you hit 70 percent of your number every quarter and this will of course differ from company to company some companies will be you know hardcore you know you're out and some will obviously not and and i'm not advocate advocating either way but i think the question that's interesting is do organizations value people that are contributing trying their best but underperforming and, and that's where it gets interesting, right? Because again, you're never going to get everyone to perform. Like I, I'm yet to meet, you know, yet to meet an organization three years later uh, that, that has everyone on, on target, right? It just doesn't happen. So I think that's where, that's where I'm sort of, I'm unsure, uh, but I think organizations can do something by implementing actions, not outcomes. Because at least then, you know, let's say, Sean, you, you're missing number, you're missing, missing your budget, but you are doing, you know, everything in terms of, you know, whether it's, you know, social selling, cleaning up the CRM, booking meetings, you know, whatever the sort of, you know, five to 10 core high value activities we have are, then, then I think you can more easily enable, you know, management to value you. Like, you know, okay, Sean's underperforming, but he's doing all of these things. But if you only have that one sales leaderboard closed one, you're, there's no chance that we're going to value you because you're underperforming. So I think that that's where this becomes, that's where I think actions and outcomes can be another really valuable, a valuable sort of tool in actually enabling the recognition of everyone in the organization, even those who are underperforming, right? And, you know, the whole, you know, I, I think a lot about this as well. And if you think, think President's Club, right? Um, which is something, by the way, I think is really good. We have one internally, a little bit different, but we have sort of the overachiever club. But, you know, for everyone that's left out of that, it's a pretty brutal sort of, you know, are they valued then? And it's easy for those people to think, I'm not valued, so I will go, I will chase the salary, I will go somewhere else. So, so that's where I think all of these topics come together. Right? Yeah, I, I, I love it. And, and I, I, think, I think they all kind of are intertwined. 
they all go together, and I think one kind of complements the other. And it's actually given me a lot to think about in regards to um, in, in regards to the culture, the, uh, the the purpose, feeling valued. Um, you know, if because sales is is a is a performance based role um, and highly highly measured on the amount of money that you you generate for the organization, I would probably say. Um, that if you have a consistent underperformer, um, uh, you know th there certainly see needs to be a a some sort of process for helping that person, uh, as well as you know maybe at a last resort or second second to last resort, it's finding out you know what what their strengths are, and maybe there's another part of the organization that they can s begin to add value in without a you know, a, a performance-based model. Yeah. And, and just to be really clear there, right, because I, I just want to make it clear for the listeners that, you know, I know some of these topics come off as a bit fluffy, HR, a little bit soft. I mean, we're, we're as hardcore a sales organization as everyone else. But, but just to make the point really clear, if you're underperforming, if you're chronically underperforming, you have to go, no doubt. What, what I'm really talking about is those people in the middle, right? They're sort of, they're halfway there, they're nearly there. Because I think here's the beauty of, of all of this all that we've talked about with engagement, with actions, not outcomes. You know, ironically, because, you know, you could say, ah, James, you're being soft. Like, we drive high performance standards. You either make it or you don't. By tapping into actions, not outcomes, and engagement, you actually give people more chance of performing. So you actually get the result you want anyway. You get, hopefully, more people hitting number. Uh, hitting their budget. So I think it just it requires a little bit of a sort of rewiring of, of the brain, right? And I think it's tough because, you know, uh, you know, when you're in sales, when you've worked in sales for many years, it, these are not natural concepts, right? Like we, we grew up in a very sort of harsh environments, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the war room, it's the pit, you know, it's, and, and, and I love that as well. Like, and, and I never want to lose that, you know, we have, we have the pit twice a week, which is like the cold calling dungeon. We go in the war room, we make it happen. So I'm not against, I'm not against hardcore sales. I love hardcore sales. That's why I started a company uh, focused on it. But I think, again, it's a rethinking of sort of, you know, how do we get everyone on board? How do we get more people to hit number? How do we actually engage and motivate people? How do we get people excited? Um, and, and that's where, that's sort of, again, that's my sort of personal mission, right? Sort of change that, rewire the, rewire the brain a little bit. So, um, well, this is fantastic, um, and I love your insight. I can clearly tell that you're an expert in in the area, um, in that you're you're in this on a daily basis. So, um, let's 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 kind of tie some of these some of these challenges that organizations face and sales or sales departments face with what what Sparta does. So, how does how does Sparta solve some of those problems that we've been talking about on the uh, retention, compensation, and so on side? Yeah, so it's 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 actually remarkably simple. Uh, it, it's really not complicated. All that we do, and you know, after this long, you know, forty-five minute pitch, the, the solution is actually very simple. And 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 you know, to be very unbiased, you can do this with us, or you can obviously try and solve it yourself. Obviously, we think we have a great solution, but just so that it's not sort of a hard sell. What we do is we we have a platform. It's a SaaS platform. It's web-based, mobile, TV tablet, all the sort of core platforms. And what customers use the product for is they create competitions. So we use we use a, a a tool that everyone knows. It's a competition, it's a contest, it's a it's a spliff, whatever. However, the big difference is we don't integrate with the CRM. So number one, we don't plug into Salesforce, we don't plug into anything like that. What we do is we help customers drive actions, not outcomes. So they set up the actions, behaviors, or activities that are important to them. We help you with that. We have a lot of sort of pre-built pre templates and activities. And that can be everything from, you know, pitching the value of the survey to, you know, booking a meeting to, you know, coming in an hour early and getting on the phones to, you know, cleaning up the CRM. I mean, the list really goes on. Whatever it is that you think will drive your team into high performance, you can, you can measure. Uh, then sales reps participate in the competitions via, again, sort of the you know web, mobile, or tablet. And what they do is they self-report. 
So they collect points for doing things. So we do not pull that data from any other CRM. And, and this is, I mean, this is question number one, right? When we, when we pitch this to customers and people say, why wouldn't you plug in with Salesforce? And our answer is that what you want to do is you want to change. If you want to, if you want to sort of, if you want to get people engaged and you want to change behavior, you need to create loops of feedback, right? It's the, it's the classic Pavlov dogs thing, right? And for, for everyone listening that has kids, this is gold stars on the fridge, right? Um, and what we do is then every time you do, you know, desired behavior X, you go into Sparta, you, you, you report that you've performed that activity and you're rewarded in real time. Uh, you know, we have all of the things I spoke about with sort of badges. It's very social. It's very transparent. It, we do leaderboards and, you know, it goes up on TV screen. So we sort of blend a little bit of the old and the new, right? It has, it has some very familiar elements, which all of us in sales have grown up with, with leaderboards, contests, all those sorts of things. But it is, it is built upon a foundation of something quite new, which is actions, not outcomes. So, so it's sales contests, but in a totally different way. Awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you, James, for being on the show. We really appreciate it. And um, how can people reach out to you, connect with uh, Sparta if they want to learn more about your product? Sure. Uh, so, so a couple of things. I think, I think one is obviously, uh, you know, spartasales.com. So spartasales.com if you want to check out the product. Um, however, you know, as, as you mentioned before, I, I'm sure everyone can hear, I'm, I'm really genuinely passionate about these topics. Um, so I think, you know, for people that want to learn more, uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter, uh, which is at James E, uh, E for Elliot Pember. Uh, but LinkedIn, it, it, you know, for those, I'm sure everyone uses LinkedIn, I think, you know, follow me on LinkedIn, feel free to connect with me. I'm sort of, you know, every day, you know, sharing content on these topics, um, uh, you know, writing about sort of, you know, sort of the intersection of psychology, sales and, and performance. So I think, you know, that's probably your best bet. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, James. And um, looking forward to getting getting this out to you all. Awesome. Thanks, Real Sales Talk family, for tuning in. And if you're loving what you're hearing, please take the time to go to iTunes and fill out a review. It would mean a lot to us. And uh, also great to get your feedback. So uh, if you have any questions or, or sales questions that you want to shoot us, just uh, uh, use the hashtag Real Sales Talk on Twitter or anywhere else that, that uh, it can be publicly searched by the hashtag. So See you all on the next episode.